Come on in, get sit down with your computer or your laptop or your tablet or what have you. Welcome. Welcome to the April edition of our monthly speaker series here at Wings Over the Rockies. I'm Chuck Stout. I'm the curator at Wings Over the Rockies. And today's topic, as you can see on your screens, is a really grand tour. Now, a lot of you have taken grand tours. Maybe you've made a grand tour of several states, or maybe you've been on a cruise and had ports of call at several places around the Mediterranean or the Caribbean. Perhaps even you've flown all the way around the world. Well, those are all great trips, but the grand tour that you'll experience over the next hour will make those look tiny. As you may know, April is the 30th anniversary of the launching of the Hubble Space Telescope. Yep, it was launched on April 24th of 1990. The idea of putting a large telescope in space goes all the way back to the 1940s. And by the mid 1970s, they had uh, the plans on the drawing board for the space shuttle, and they knew that they could probably get a large space telescope up. So the, uh, the project was funded in 1977, and somewhere along the line, somebody suggested that they name it after Edwin Hubble. So who was this Edwin Hubble anyway? Well, he was an astronomer, as you might expect, and uh, he was a guy who figured out that the things that we had been calling spiral nebulas through the history of astronomy up until then were actually galaxies, galaxies of hundreds of millions of stars, just like the Milky Way that we live in. He also discovered that the galaxies were all flying away from us. They were all receding from us and that the farther away they were, the faster they were receding. And assembling all these pieces in his brilliant mind, he figured out the idea of an expanding universe. And of course, that led to the idea of the Big Bang, which is, you know, standard, uh, standard in every astronomy course now. So this space telescope was going to be big. The primary mirror was going to be 2.4 meters in diameter. That's about eight feet. Uh, here's a picture of the finished mirror. And yes, that's a real reflection of that technician standing on the right. Uh, the Hubble was ready for launch in about 1985, and it was scheduled to be launched in 1986. But something terrible happened. It is the worst disaster in the history of the American space program, and President Reagan has declared a week of mourning for the seven astronauts, five men and two women, who lost their lives on their way into space this morning. Now we know that yep, that's right. The, news, uh, the Challenger ago. accident. The space shuttle Challenger exploded on launch, and uh, no shuttles flew for the next two and a half years. So what did they do with the Hubble Space Telescope? Lockheed put it in a clean room and stored it. And it was stored until it was gotten ready for launch in 1990. Go for main engine start, and T minus six, five, four, three, two, one, and liftoff of the Space Shuttle Discovery with the Hubble Space Telescope, our window on the universe. And there it goes. There's liftoff of the uh, Space Shuttle Discovery, STS-31. And uh, you notice that in the foreground there, on the left side, there's another shuttle on the pad. Uh, Discovery lifted off from launch pad 39B at Cape Canaveral. And on pad 39A, the Columbia was waiting for another launch. So the Hubble Space Telescope was deployed from the payload bay of the Discovery by the Canadian arm. And Boy, that's, that's a big instrument. You can see it there on the Canadian arm and uh, the earth behind it. It's just a gorgeous picture. So how big was it? Well, it was 43 and a half feet long. That's about like a school bus. Shortly after the Hubble went into operation, they discovered that there had been a, a flaw in grinding that big primary mirror. Now, the flaw wasn't very much. It was about one four hundred and seventy fifth of the thickness of a human hair, but it put off some of the images uh, that they were getting back. So fortunately, the Hubble Space Telescope was designed 
to be repaired and to have new instruments installed while it was in orbit. So on the first mission to service the uh, Hubble Space Telescope in 1993, the astronauts installed new instruments that had corrective optics in them, and that solved the problem. By the way, those servicing missions uh, went up to the orbit of the Hubble Space Telescope, which is about 350 miles uh, above sea level. And unfortunately, that is the farthest that human beings have traveled into space since the Apollo missions. Think of that. That's barely the distance from here down to Albuquerque, and that's the farthest that humans have ventured away from their planet in more than 50 years. So we talked about going on a, a grand tour. Well, you always start planning your tour with reading a bunch of brochures and getting an idea of uh, what it's going to cost, writing big checks, getting your traveler's checks, packing, and of course getting those uh, immunizations that we all look forward to so much. But for today's grand tour, you're not going to have to write a check for anything. You're not going to need any traveler's checks. You're not going to have to do any packing. We're going to be back in less than an hour. And best of all, nobody's going to stick you with any needles. Okay, let's just drive out to the uh, Colorado Air and Space Port, which is currently known as the Front Range Airport, uh, and board our magical space vehicle. I say magical because we're going to go way faster than the speed of light. We're going to cheat time and distance, and uh, it's going to be a, a wonderful trip. We board our space vehicle and get strapped in, listen to the passenger briefing as we taxi out, and then uh, since we're going to be flying in a space vehicle that is carried up into the atmosphere by a carrier vehicle, we relax and take off in a take off similar to an airliner and climb out over the plains of eastern Colorado. As we get higher, we see those farm fields getting smaller. As the carrier airplane takes us up over most of the atmosphere, the sky starts turning darker and darker blue and finally turns black. Then the uh, captain fires the rocket engines and we begin to accelerate out of the Earth's gravity well. We climb faster and faster, and uh, because this is a magical vehicle, we quickly reach escape velocity and start hurtling away from the Earth at hundreds of thousands of miles per hour. And we see it receding into the distance as we look back through the back windows. I'm going to put up a map of the solar system as of today. This is where the Earth is in its orbit, and this is how the planets are oriented as of April 24th. Now, from time to time, we'll bring this chart back to show our progress on our trip. Our first port of call appears as a kind of a faint red dot. You can see it off to the left side there. Some of you have already guessed what that's going to be. That's right, we're going to Mars. We're going to make a quick flyby of Mars on our way out of the solar system. So as we get closer to Mars, you can see that it's uh, resolving a little bit of uh, detail. This is about the best view that astronomers on Earth had for hundreds of years. And they could see polar ice caps. They could see differences in the surface that they took for maybe seasonal vegetation watered by the uh, melting of the polar ice caps periodically, and uh, eventually Schiaparelli thought that he saw canals on Mars and sketched a, a system of canals, and that idea really caught on and people thought there were canals on Mars for many years. But as we get closer to Mars, you can see that there is no canal system, but there are some amazing tourist attractions. Mars has a wonderful atmosphere, it's not very thick, and uh, the winds sometimes howl at hundreds of miles per hour, kicking up uh, planet-wide dust storms. But Mars has this great canyon system that makes our Grand Canyon look like a little uh, drainage ditch. Uh, you could put several Grand Canyons inside of the Valles Marineris. It also has 
an amazingly tall mountain. This was named Mount Olympus by the astronomers. It is two and a half times the height of Mount Everest. As we flash past Mount Olympus, you can look back and see it in, uh, in shadow as we go into the darker side of, of Mars on our way out. Our next uh, stop off is this planet up ahead. It's just a, a faint smudge there on the left. And what are those four dots beside it? Well, that's what Galileo wondered back in 1610 when he looked through his telescope. He was the first person to notice that there were these little dots around planet Jupiter and they changed places. And he was very clever and he figured out that those were moons or orbiting the planet Jupiter. And here's our uh, solar system map again. You'll see that we've gone past Mars and gone out towards Jupiter. One of the points that I'd like to make is that we're taking advantage of an alignment of the Earth and Mars and some other planets. And you can go out early in the morning and look to the east and see these planets just above the horizon before the sun rises. And as we get closer, we get to see a great view. Jupiter is the largest of the planets in our solar system, and it's had that great big red spot for as long as people have been able to discern any surface features on Jupiter. That great red spot is a, a storm. It's like a big hurricane, but it's lasted hundreds of years, and it's huge. That spot is the size of two Earths. You could put two planet Earths inside that spot. Now, just think of that. Everything on our whole planet, everybody you've ever known, everything that's ever been built or constructed or invented by human beings, all of that would fit twice into that great red spot. As we get closer, you can start to see the, the turbulence in the atmosphere and the colorful clouds. We're going to skim by pretty close here. The uh, the colors in the clouds are caused by different chemicals in the atmosphere of Jupiter. Now we're going to uh, take a little tour of those four moons that Galileo was able to see. The first one that we'll stop at is Io, or Io, if you pronounce it that way. It is bright yellow. That's the sulfur that wells up from underneath, uh, because this is the most volcanically active moon that we've ever found. It has volcanoes that are driven by the tidal heating of its orbit around Jupiter that causes pushes and pulls on the, the crust like you were squeezing it. And uh, those volcanoes come and go and they're constantly erupting. At any given time, there are 20 to 30 volcanoes on the surface of Io at any given time. And look, you can see one erupting right now. We're kind of past Io and looking back and the sunlight coming through the, uh, the plume of that volcano is lit it up very nicely for us. The next moon that we'll visit is Europa. Now Europa is the smoothest body in the solar system. Uh, it's got very few surface flaws. It's just smoother than a billiard ball. And uh, it's really exciting. And what makes it so exciting is that it is a, a rocky planet. It's a silicate planet, but it has this icy crust on it. And between the icy crust and the surface of the planet, there is probably a liquid water ocean. Now this has great significance because liquid water is kind of the recipe for the possibility of life. Could there be microbial life in that ocean under the surface? Well, that's what we're hoping to find out. At least two space missions are headed to Europa to explore it in the next few years. Uh, the European Space Agency is launching a probe to Europa in 2022, and I believe NASA has one scheduled to launch in 2025. So another thing that is exciting about Europa is that because of the uh, heating and flexing of that icy crust, cracks appear and there are water geysers that shoot up out of the surface. 
It's a very young surface. You'll notice as we get closer that there are very, very few impact craters. That's, that's how astronomers know how old the surface of a planet is. They can kind of use the number of craters as a clock. As you get closer, you can see a lot more of the surface features. Uh, the icy crust is constantly flexing and cracking and healing, and that's what keeps it so smooth. You'll notice that there are very, very few impact craters on the surface. That's the sign that this is a very young surface. It's constantly being renewed. Now we'll visit Ganymede, another of the Galilean moons of Jupiter. Uh, Ganymede is the largest and most massive uh, of the moons in the solar system. This moon of Jupiter is actually larger than the entire planet Mercury. And it's got a, an iron core, and that iron core is constantly being heated, and the flow of uh, metals around in that core actually give Ganymede a magnetic field, one of the few bodies in the solar system to have its own magnetic field. As you get closer to Ganymede, you can see surface features, few impact craters, but again, this surface is fairly smooth and fairly young. Next, we'll visit Callisto, uh, where most of these other Galilean satellites have been pretty smooth. Callisto is probably the most heavily cratered body in the solar system. As we get closer, we can see a lot more surface detail on Callisto. Uh, in spite of the fact that it's so heavily cratered, it is still considered to be a candidate for a, a moon that might have a subsurface ocean. But because it orbits so much farther from Jupiter than Europa does, it doesn't get nearly as much tidal heating, and therefore it's probably not as likely to have a subsurface ocean. Nevertheless, it does have a very, very thin atmosphere, uh, mostly carbon dioxide with a little bit of oxygen. So as we leave the Jupiter system and its moons behind and cheat the speed of light uh, limits again and go to our next destination, you can see it up ahead on the left there. It looks like a, another Jupiter, but with ears. At least that's what Galileo thought when he looked through his telescope back in 1610. That's right, it's Saturn. Saturn with the beautiful, beautiful ring system. This is a Hubble Space Telescope image, and it shows exquisite detail in the uh, rings as well as in the planet itself. Once again, we put up our star chart, and you can see that uh, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn are pretty much aligned with the Earth. And I would again invite you to go out before dawn uh, and look to the east and see all three of them lined up, clustered together in the eastern sky just before the sun comes up. As you can see, the captain has gotten us very close to Saturn. Uh, and you can see four of Saturn's moons in this picture. That uh, orange spot near the, the top is Titan. And then there are two of the smaller moons casting their shadows near the left side. And then you can just see a fourth moon just above the rings on the right. Now, the most distinctive feature of Saturn, of course, is its brilliant ring system. Now, what's amazing to me about the ring system is how thin it is. Uh, the ring system is only about uh, 30 feet thick in most places, and it may be some of the thickest parts are as much as a kilometer thick, but that is incredibly tiny on the scale of planets. Now we get a view through the rings almost edge on of two of uh, Saturn's moons. The big one is Titan, and it's the size of a, a small planet and it has an atmosphere. And then the little one is Epimetheus. Now, one of the other things about the rings is that they're composed almost completely of water ice, just tiny little ice crystals. One of Saturn's most interesting moons is Enceladus. It's beautiful with its white and blue there. 
And uh, Enceladus is another one of those very interesting planets with a, a very young surface, very few impact craters. As we get closer, we can see a lot of surface uh, detail, and it's got very varied terrain. There's a lot going on on the surface of Enceladus, and we also believe that there's a lot going on underneath the surface. Now, why do we think that? Because of this. When we look at it uh, with the sun behind the, the horizon there, we see geysers, geysers of water shooting into the sky from this moon. So it might be another uh, moon that has a subsurface ocean. Now, this is another moon of Saturn. This moon's name is Tethys. And Tethys' main claim to fame is that when Star Wars fans see it, they think it's the Death Star. This is Mimas. This is another of Saturn's moons. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, well, didn't we just see that one? That looks just like Tethys. Well, Mimas is a lot smaller than Tethys. And that is what makes it so interesting. It also looks like the Death Star. So here's a close-up of Mimas. And you'll notice that it is a lot rougher on its surface than most of the other uh, moons that we've seen. That's because it's so small. Now, most celestial bodies, when they start gathering bits and pieces and, and colliding with chunks and, and forming larger chunks, they end up looking kind of lumpy, like a, a potato or like a, a clump of uh, a dirt stuck together. But when things reach a certain diameter, they have enough gravity of their own that they start pulling themselves into a sphere. And so far as we know, Mimas is the smallest uh, body that we've discovered so far that has had enough gravity to pull itself into a sphere. The last moon that we'll explore in the Saturn system is Iapetus. And way back in 1670, Giovanni Cassini was observing Iapetus and noticed that he could only see it when it was on one side of Saturn. And uh, he correctly figured out that it must have a bright side and a dark side, and that it must be tidally locked, meaning that one side always faced towards Saturn, so that on one side of Saturn he could see the bright side, and on the other side he would only see a dark side. And when we sent probes, that's exactly how it turned out to be. Now, why is one side lighter and, and the other side darker? Well, it turns out that the side that always faces into the wind, the side that's leading as it orbits Saturn, is the dark side. And initially they figured that uh, it heated up and some of the ice that coats the surface had sublimated off and then it condensed back on the, the bright white side. So you've got snow on the, the white side and bare rock on the other side. And as time goes on, that creates kind of a thermal runaway where the darker area heats up more, which puts more ice vapor into the uh, atmosphere and causes more snow on the light side. So the light side is always getting brighter and the dark side is always getting larger and darker. And that dark side is pretty much a uniform reddish brown. It looks like somebody spilled Hershey's cocoa all over it. So as we leave the Saturn system, we look back and we see that we've created an artificial eclipse. And with the sun on the other side, we can see the delicate ring structure and even some of the fainter rings that are farther out than the highly visible rings. Goodbye, Saturn. Our next destination is further out along the same general line that we've been traveling. It's a faint dot off in the distance there. This is the uh, best image that the Hubble Space Telescope was able to produce. This uh, desperately far away. But just recently, within the last five years, we've gotten some much, much better images. Here is what we saw. And uh, as you probably guessed by now, this is Pluto. And we are going to make a, a little pass past Pluto on our way out of the solar system. 
You'll notice that we skipped Uranus and Neptune. They're on a, a different part of their orbit and not along our, our line of travel. So we get to see Pluto. Pluto and its moon Charon are actually a, a double planet system. Charon is very close to the same size as, as Pluto. This is uh, an actual picture imaged from the New Horizons spacecraft that uh, arrived in Pluto space in 2015. Pluto turned out to be a lot more interesting than we ever dreamed that it could be. Pluto has um, an amazing variety of surface features and it's uh, a lot more geologically active than we ever expected. It's got incredible uh, surface features that kind of defy explanation and scientists are coming up with all kinds of different theories to explain them. The surface sometimes is just thousands and thousands of tiny little holes. There are also areas that have dunes. There are also areas with mountain ridges and canyons. Here's a kind of a lineup of the moons of Pluto. Uh, Pluto, Charon, Styx, Nix, Cerberus, and Hydra. They're all to the same scale in this picture, although the uh, distances are not to scale. And as we recede away from Pluto on our way out of the solar system, we do create another one of those artificial solar eclipses. And you can see that Pluto actually has an atmosphere and it's an oxygen atmosphere. It's very thin and very, uh, very low pressure, but it's there. So now as we leave Pluto behind and speed through the Kuiper belt and get out into interstellar space, uh, we're leaving our solar system behind. Our navigation chart now shows pretty much a straight line as we are no longer uh, having deviations pulled by the sun or the planets exerting their gravitational pull on us. Our next destination lies in the direction of Sagittarius. Uh, we're still on that straight line leading away from the, the solar system, but now we're traveling at many times the speed of light and we're headed out into the constellation of Lyra, the Lyra. Here's how it would look. I'll let you absorb that. The Lyra is on the right side there. Cygnus, the swan, is in the middle. And there's the star that we're headed for. It's the second brightest star in the Lyra constellation. Therefore, it's called Beta Lyra. It's about 960 light years from Earth. Now, Beta Lyra is an interacting binary. There are two stars orbiting a common center of gravity. One's much larger than the other. And just based on the observations that we've seen, uh, we've got a pretty good idea of what's going on there. A very gifted artist named Chesley Bonestell came up with this image of what the Beta Lyra system probably looks like. You've got a large star that is pulling material away from its smaller neighbor, which actually used to be the larger star, but when it became a, a large red giant and uh, collapsed and threw off some of its uh, outer uh, shells, those fed the other star, which became bigger and started pulling more material from the smaller star. And as a consequence, there are spirals of glowing hydrogen gas being spun away from the binary pair. This was such a, a wonderful idea that it got painted many times by many different artists. This is Chesley Bonestell's original 1960 painting of it. Other artists have pretty much copied the same sort of thing with different landscapes underneath. And it was even copied by Chesley Bonestell. Again, he painted another landscape and another version of it in 1978. Here's yet another uh, version of it, uh, showing the stars up close and skipping the spiral of hydrogen gas arcing away from it. 
Leaving Beta Lyra behind, we head for our next destination. It's another 1,500 light years ahead, making a total of 2,500 light years, but it's really big. It's the Ring Nebula. Now, this is the remnant of a supernova explosion, and this is a Hubble Space Telescope image of it. As we get closer, you'll begin to appreciate just how amazing that Hubble Space Telescope image is and the amount of fine detail it's able to capture. As we get closer, you can see all of those different uh, layers of ionized uh, gas. And this is a very large uh, feature. The uh, Ring Nebula is about 1.3 light years in diameter. My gosh, we could fly right through the middle of it, couldn't we? Well, we've flown through the middle of it, and now we're seeing it in the rearview mirror, and uh, kind of gives you an appreciation for how beautiful things in the sky can be. Our next destination is more than 6,500 light years away. Now we're really speeding along. As we see it, it might or might not look familiar to you. This is a Hubble Space Telescope image taken in the infrared, but you're more familiar with it in its visible light version. That's right, it's the Pillars of Creation, and they're called that because as stars die and give off gas and dust, those gas and dust clouds are accumulated into new stars, and inside these clouds, new stars are being born. The Hubble Space Telescope images are just incredible in the amount of detail that they're able to capture. And, uh, but we also have to remember that these are huge structures that are light years across. As we speed on further into interstellar space, we can begin to uh, appreciate that we are in a galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy. Our galaxy, if you could see it from outside, has two companion galaxies. You can't see them from Colorado. They're only visible from the southern hemisphere, but they are the large Magellanic Cloud and the small Magellanic Cloud. Both of them are dwarf galaxies. Now, as we move out away from our own galaxy, the Milky Way, into intergalactic space, we start seeing other galaxies, and there are some very interesting galaxies out there. This is a Hubble Space Telescope image, and there's just so much going on in this picture. Uh, there are old red stars that are exploding and spreading their uh, material into big clouds of dust and gas that are in the process of condensing into newborn stars, and there are uh, there's radiation illuminating things and ionizing a lot of those gases into beautiful colors. Uh, it's just an amazing picture. We're going to see mostly galaxies out here in the space between stars. We're uh, exploring our local galactic group. Here's our, our star chart, and uh, you can see the Milky Way uh, by the red label there and our Magellanic Clouds. And then the Andromeda Galaxy is also part of our uh, local cluster, as are several dwarf galaxies. You see, I told you we'd see some interesting things out here in the space between galaxies. Uh, here's a galaxy eating another one. Well, not really. There are two galaxies here, and they are interacting with each other. Uh, we've determined that through observations. This is another Hubble Space Telescope image, and the one on the left there is called the Whirlpool Galaxy. It was the very first galaxy to be classified as a spiral galaxy after they decided that spiral nebulas were actually galaxies. There's so much going on in that galaxy. There are stars exploding, old stars dying, young stars being born from the clouds of dust and gas, expelled by the exploding stars. There's a massive black hole in the middle of it that's uh, sucking up lots of uh, matter. And uh, you can see some pretty interesting things. 
Actually, you can see this one from, uh, well, if you get out away from the city lights, you can see this galaxy with good binoculars or with a, a good amateur telescope. The Whirlpool Galaxy, M51. As we get beyond our local cluster, we begin to realize that there are other clusters of galaxies. Now, keep in mind that each galaxy is com composed of hundreds of millions of stars. And each of those clusters could be from a half dozen to several dozen galaxies. And when you start seeing them clustered into larger clusters, you begin to get a feel for the structure of the entire universe. Our local cluster is the uh, part of the Virgo supercluster. Now what happens when you get out into the space between galaxies is that you don't see individual stars anymore. All you see are galaxies because all of the stars clump together into galaxies. This is an iconic image. Way back in 1995, when the uh, Hubble Space Telescope was still fairly new, uh, the astronomers had an idea that they would take some images of the darkest part of the sky. And they would open the shutter and leave it open for hours and hours and hours. This image was pieced together from several different exposures that they took over a period of 10 days. It's called the first Hubble Deep Field. And deep field means that it's seeing not stars, not stars within our own galaxy. We're looking outside of our galaxy and seeing other galaxies. Just about everything that you see in this picture is another galaxy, just like the Milky Way. Only each galaxy contains hundreds of millions of stars. Then in 2004, they took another image, the Hulk the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. And this is an even more impressive image. Uh, they had gotten some better photographic techniques and they were able to capture a lot of the uh, color variations between galaxies. And here we're seeing thousands upon thousands upon thousands of galaxies, each of which are composed of hundreds of millions of stars. So then in 2012, they took the extreme Hubble Deep Field image. And this one uh, shows many more galaxies. Uh, it just boggles my mind to think of these thousands upon thousands upon thousands of galaxies farther and farther and farther away from Earth. And as we look farther away from Earth and find objects that are farther away, we're actually looking back in time and because it takes time for the light to go from its source to the telescope. And as we look back farther and farther in time, the Hubble is able to see back closer and closer to the birth of the universe, the Big Bang itself. So as we continue traveling deeper and deeper into the cosmos, there's a very bright object up ahead. As we get closer, we notice that there's a small jet of material that is squirting out to the uh, lower right of it. Now, as we get up closer to it, we can see what that jet of energy is, and we recognize this as a quasar. Now, a quasar is the most distant object that we've been able to see. They go back to just a few hundred million years after the birth of our universe a few hundred million years after the Big Bang. Now, a quasar is an amazingly luminous object. Even though it is a very dim object when you look up at it in the night sky, each of these objects, because they're so far away, is more brilliant. They're thousands of times more brilliant than an entire galaxy, a galaxy of hundreds of millions of stars. All of that concentrated into an area the size of a star. They're also massive. They're billions of times more massive than our sun. They have a, a black hole at the middle, but even at that, all of this energy is being emitted by the, the matter that's being sucked into that black hole. As our imagery and our understanding of quasars has grown, we've discovered that inside each of them is a supermassive black hole. 
and that quasars are usually associated with young uh, galaxies. So now we're going to zoom back home at hundreds of thousands of light years per second. And as we start approaching our uh, galaxy from the other side, we'll fly through one of those Magellanic clouds. This is the smaller Magellanic cloud. Now as we start getting closer to the small Magellanic cloud, we notice that there are nebulas inside. Now as we get closer, we're going to go through this nebula, and uh, it's got a star cluster at its center. This is the nebula N90, and the star cluster is NGC 602. Now, there's a lot going on here. Uh, that star cluster is putting out radiation and shock waves that are driving the clouds of dust and gas together, and they are forming those uh, distinctive elephant trunks that you see across the top, like the Pillars of Creation. And like in the Pillars of Creation, there are baby stars being formed and born inside those clouds of dust and gas. It's a very interesting picture. This is another Hubble Space Telescope image. We're, we're not home yet. Uh, we're still about 200,000 light years from Earth. As we cruise at many times the speed of light back home, we're going to take a, a dive through the Crab Nebula. Now, the Crab Nebula wasn't there uh, a few hundred years ago. This was uh, a star that exploded in 1054 AD, and it became a supernova explosion that was visible even in daylight. Uh, and it's called the Crab Nebula because it's in the constellation of Cancer. And this supernova has a pulsar at its core. As we get closer, you can see the incredible detail that the Hubble Space Telescope was able to pick up even from 6,500 light years away. But then this thing is many light years across. We'll dive right through the middle of it. Look at those wispy little filaments of glowing gas and dust in there. And here is the pulsar, the pulsar at its core. Now, pulsars were first discovered because they seem like uh, uh, regular radio signals. Uh, there were bursts of, of radio energy lasting from a few milliseconds or several milliseconds per uh, revolution up to a few per minute. And it turns out that they're rapidly spinning neutron stars. We will complete our trip home by diving through the Helix Nebula, which is only 650 light years away. We'll zoom in on this little circled star here. It's a very interesting star system that you may have heard about in the news. It's the TRAPPIST-1 star system. Uh, it's only about 40 light years from Earth, but what's interesting about it is that we've detected seven exoplanets orbiting the star and three of those planets are in what's called the Goldilocks zone. Well, there's an area that's too close to the star for liquid water to exist. All the water gets boiled away, and then there's an area that's too far away from the star, and any water that's there freezes into ice. But in between those two areas, there's an area where liquid water could exist on the surface of a planet. And the TRAPPIST-1 system has three planets that are orbiting in that area, which is called the Goldilocks zone, because it's not too hot and it's not too cold. Could any of these planets support life? Well, we don't know. Water is usually thought of as, as one of the prerequisites for life. And if there were complex molecules in those oceans, and if they developed into uh, organisms, then we might be able to detect some kind of life if we were able to get to those planets. Here, an artist has tried to imagine what it might be like on one of those three planets in the TRAPPIST-1 system. So, we're still going pretty fast. We're almost back home. This is uh, our closest celestial companion. This is the surface of the moon. You can tell it's the moon because that's the Earth rising just over the horizon there. Ah, uh, it's good to be coming home again, isn't it? Even though we've been gone less than an hour. 
Our re-entry is almost complete. You can look down and see the Great Wall of China below us. As we scream across the Pacific, what's that island chain down there? Oh, I know, it's Hawaii. We all recognize the Grand Canyon as we're now down to about airliner altitudes. We even recognize the Behringer Crater as we fly over. And here we are coming into the traffic pattern at the Colorado Spaceport at Front Range. Uh, after we land, please wait for the spacecraft to come to a complete stop. And before you get off, be sure to check the overhead compartments. Make sure you're not leaving anything behind. And thank you very much. I hope you've enjoyed this grand tour. If you'd like to email me, there's my uh, email address on the screen. And thank you. Thank you very much for watching and thanks very much for supporting the museum. And we look forward to the day when you can come back in and visit us in person.